Hello, Google. My name is, okay, well, they wanted to respond, so we'll do that. Okay, so hello, Google. Um, my name is Maysoon Zayed, and the day I was born, I almost died. I came out fist first, ready to fight the power. Unfortunately, the doctor who delivered me was not ready for this jelly. He cut my mom six different times in six different directions. The first cut gave me my first breath, and then the dear old doc smothered me. So I have brain damage. Aren't you jealous? Um, I have what is called cerebral palsy, and cerebral palsy is a spectrum, and the symptoms are totally different depending on the person with CP. In my case, I shake all the time. So I shake it, shake it, shake it like Taylor Swift. Except she just wants to shake, shake, shake. And mine is totally involuntary. Okay, Google, this is comedy. Come on a journey with me. At some point, every single one of you has dreamt of being disabled. It's Christmas Eve. You're at the mall. You're driving around looking for parking. And what do you see? 16 empty handicap spaces. And you're like, God, can I be a little disabled, just like dyslexic or something? So I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, which makes me bridge and tunnel. And um, I grew up in a time where I was completely oblivious to the fact that being Muslim, Palestinian, brown, a girl, and someone with a disability would be something that in the future would be used against me. I had no idea that being an other was a bad thing. I grew up in an extremely diverse town with 33,000 Italian Catholics and six Arabs that were all my family. <laughs> And I don't think anyone ever noticed that I wasn't, you know, one of them, because look at me. I look like the lost Kardashian. <laughs> People can't just guess. But when I grew up, I, I encountered something that I was never prepared for. Because as a child, I was never bullied. I was never mocked. When I was growing up, Muslim wasn't a slur used by candidates in campaigns to gain the hate vote. It was just, Maysoon doesn't eat for a whole month. And she doesn't lose a single pound. It's fascinating. But then I encountered something. I encountered social media. And my entire world changed. I started my dalliance with social media back in the days of chat rooms. And no, it's not the chat rooms that you think. I only frequented one chat room, the Soap Opera Digest chat room. I would spend hours a day discussing a soap opera that I had watched since I was five years old. Because even though I was born to extremely strict Palestinian Muslim parents, my parents had no idea that they should monitor what I watched on TV. <laughs> So I was all about love in the daytime and Andrew Dice Clay. These are the things that I, that I loved. So I started off in the chat rooms. It was nice. Everything was great. I had AOL dial-up. You had to put a CD in. They, computers used to have these CD ROMs, you know, because I'm like 150 in Google years. I walked around this building and did not see a single old person. I think that you guys put them to sleep at 40 and then wake them up again at 100 because Google's nefarious and you can do that. Um, so my next thing, though, was Facebook. And I was sitting in a room with, my, with one of my bridesmaids. I've been a bridesmaid 17 times, and I spent $28,000 on my friends' weddings. So when I turned 33, I decided to get married because I wanted to make my money back. And because also, like, married people, they sucker you into marriage, and they don't explain anything about it. So, you know, they dress like a Michelin man. It looks like it's all fun. They get all these gifts, and they don't tell you that it's a 50-year commitment. They're just like, yeah, I went to Belize. So... <laughs> At 33, I decided to get married because I wanted to make my, my money back, and I went to catch a husband. Now, let me be clear about this. 
People seem to think that people with disabilities don't like date. They think we're these eternal snowflake angel babies that are like, eh, I'm so happy. And that's like totally not true. We do date. And I wasn't desperate when I got married. If my dad had allowed me to marry someone who wasn't Palestinian, I could have married this guy named Mike. But my dad said that he would throw himself off the George Washington Bridge. And I couldn't bear the image of them fishing him out all bloated and shit. So I had to catch a husband. And um, the way my parents met is really, really, really romantic. It's, it's definitely something, it's, it's such a beautiful story. And I think that when people think of Muslim or Arab or Palestinian, they don't think of romance. But the way my parents met is so beautiful. They're first cousins. <laughs> my dad swears that the very first time he saw my mom, he knew she was the one. And I was like, Daddy, how did you know she was the one? And he said, your grandfather, he told me. <laughs> but I couldn't do what my parents did because I am way too disabled to inbreed. And I couldn't go on Match.com because typing is not my thing. So I was like, where am I going to catch a husband? Do you guys want to know where I caught him? I'm like a seal. I won't do anything if you don't clap and scream. You want to know where I caught him? I went to Gaza. And the reason I went to Gaza is because they got no place to run. So here's what I did. I took my American passport and I framed it in a big gold frame. And I just walked through the refugee camp going, you want a visa, baby? And my husband was like, yeah. So I'm like, pack up your stuff. Let's go. And he's like, I have no stuff. So this is another time that the internet came into my life really strongly because all of my friends had these amazing proposals. Like my friend Janet, she was like, so he wrote I love you on the Scrabble board and then we went up in a hot air balloon, the balloon exploded and the smoke wrote, will you marry me? And as we were plumbing to our desk, parachutes opened and he slid a Tiffany diamond on my hand. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't have the coordination for any of that. Like, none of it. So I bought a diamond ring and I gave it to him because he was a starving refugee. Where's he going to get a diamond from, right? And I showed him a clip um, of the season finale of The Bachelorette. And I'm like, this is how you propose, but you don't leave two weeks later. And you have to surprise me. And then I waited one week, two weeks three weeks, and I was like, oh man, he stole the ring. And I was like, probably needs to feed his family, it's okay. And then I was crossing a checkpoint, and I see him on the other side like this. And I'm like, oh my God, now they're gonna shoot him, I'm never gonna get that ring. Like, what am I gonna do, just loot the body? Excuse me, it's mine. Um, so then he held out the ring, and like everything disappeared. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he went, here, take it. <laughs> and I went, yes, he speaks English. <laughs> so as I said, I was never bullied as a child. I was never made fun of. And I happened to have the exact same best friends that I had when I was five years old, the Jersey Girls. And <laughs> yeah, and my friends totally treated me as an equal at all times. So when I turned 21, I became everyone's designated driver. And the reason they did this was because Muslims don't drink, or at least we don't admit to it on social media. So they were like, oh, perfect. You know, Maysoon can be the designated driver because she doesn't want to go to hell, and it's great. And, uh, you know, remember, no bacon. And then... Um, but it was a horrible idea because law enforcement is actually not trained to deal with people with disabilities, right? And I thought about this a lot during Hands Up, Don't Shoot because my hands don't go up. They just stop right here. And when I used to get pulled over, because I'm a speed demon, when I used to get pulled over, the cop would come to the car and I would go to hand him my license and I'd be like, hey, and he'd be like, are you drunk? And I'd be like, I'm not drunk, I'm different differently abled. And then he would ask my best friend Tina, who was sitting next to me, like slumped with like vomit in her hair. And they'd be like, is she drunk? And I will never, ever forget the first time this happened. The officer asked her, is she drunk? And Tina said, no, she's retarded. And I was like, oh my 
God, where do I even begin with you? And the thing is, my friend Tina never caught on. And it's fascinating to me that she thought I had Down syndrome, didn't realize that retard was a slur, and had been my best friend since I was five. And then I remembered, Tina doesn't catch on. My friends spent every single summer at the Jersey Shore, and my dad would send us back to Palestine to the war because he was convinced that if we didn't go to the Middle East every single summer, we would forget our heritage and grow up to be Britney Spears. And every single year when I went, she would come up to me and ask the same question. Are you scared? Are you scared to go to Pakistan? <laughs> so... After Tina responds to the police officer, then he looked at me and he said, ma'am, I'm going to need you to walk a straight line. And I was like, no, I can't. And then I was like, can I just do the alphabet backwards? Z, Y, X, W, V. And he was like, I can't even do it forward, go. Um, but like I said, I had the same friends my entire life. And so when I joined Facebook, my Facebook friends were my actual friends. And I had no idea what I was doing. So my first status was, I am on Facebook. And I was so disappointed because I, I like researched it for this talk and I thought it would be something like really deep. And I was like, oh my God, I just said I am on Facebook. So Facebook, I had actual friends. And then I joined Twitter. And on Twitter, I met the trolls. And I've been a comedian for 15 years. And I grew up in a time before YouTube. So I actually had to go to comedy clubs and like stand and wait my turn. And if you didn't bring five people to watch you, you weren't allowed to get on stage. And it was like a brutal game. And my very first job as a comedian was driving famous New York comics from New York to New Jersey to do shows in Atlantic City. And I would be like speeding down the turnpike and they would be terrified because I'd be like, no, I'm an excellent driver. I swear to God. And then I'd whip into the handicapped space and they would forget their fear. They were like, yeah, yeah, she's good. And um, so I had had to deal with hecklers my whole life. So internet trolls were no big deal for me. I thought it was fun. Like, I basically have a strategy for my internet trolls. First, I try to educate. And what I mean by that is I have some really well-meaning trolls. They just want to help me. They just want to save me. So... In 2013, I did this TED Talk. Now, prior to that, I was actually known as the Arab J-Lo. I kid you not. This is very funny. I was a comedian, and I had gone on uh, tours called The Arabs Gone Wild, and Allah Made Me Funny, and I did, I shot a documentary called The Muslims Are Coming, where we, this guy who is my partner, Dino Bidala, he came up with this brilliant idea for a bunch of Muslim comics to tour places in the deep south that had like set mosques on fire and like peed on Qurans. So we went in August during Ramadan to shoot a documentary in Alabama, Mississippi, Gainesville, Florida, uh, Columbus, Georgia, I mean, Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, I was fasting the entire time that we were on tour, which really gave me patience for bigotry. Um, it's amazing when you're hangry how much the, how much patience you have for these people. But even worse than that was my producer. And my producer came up to me one day and she said, listen, we can't stop after the show for you to, to eat because the shows were always during the time that I was supposed to break my fast. She said, we have to get to the next city. So can you just grab like a bagel or something? And I was like, no, I can't survive on a bagel for the next 24 hours. And the producer looked at me and she said, Maysoon, nobody told you to fast. And I said, nobody told you to do a documentary about Muslims during Ramadan and expect no one to be fasting. So... I was known as the Arab J-Lo, <laughs> and then I did this TED Talk. And when I did my TED Talk, I called it 99 Problems and Palsy is Just One. And the point was to get Beyonce's attention. That's actually the only point. Um, <laughs> no, the point was to say that we are more than just our disabilities. And I did this entire talk about how people with disabilities are the largest minority in the world and we're the most underrepresented on television. And when we are represented, it's usually by able-bodied 
actors cripping up. And the disabled community finds that really offensive. We believe that much like race, physical, visible disability cannot be played. And even though they have different histories and oppressions, both people have been exploited through media. And as a people, by the way, we have absolutely no way of knowing how many on-air personalities and performers have invisible disabilities, because there's such a stigma against things like mental illness and chronic pain that to this day, actors and anchors and hosts don't feel comfortable disclosing a disability that can't be visibly seen. But if you turn on your TV today, you can click to any daytime show from CNN to MSNBC, Good Morning America, The Today Show, The View, The Talk. There is not a single visibly disabled person on television right now. So when I got my big break, it was I got invited to be on Countdown with Keith Oberman. And uh, when he invited me on the show, nobody knew I was disabled. I went in and I joked about politics. I was talking about Saudi Arabia and Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin at the time. And the fact that I had disability never came up. It wasn't part of the conversation. So when I went home, I decided to join Twitter because Keith Oberman was my Mr. Miyagi. And if he tweeted, so would I. I was like, wax tweet, wax off, you know. <laughs> And so I went on Twitter and all of a sudden I started having people guess what was wrong with me. And they were like, did you see that girl on Keith Overman's show? I think she was drunk. Oh my God, her lip was so distracting, I just wanted to yank it up. Or my favorite one, she looks like an honor killing gone wrong. And somebody else called me a Gumby Mouth terrorist and said they should pray for me. So that was my first experience with trolls. But on the other side, as I said, were the trolls with good intentions, those who wanted to save me. And they would say, May soon, you were so funny. I loved your TED Talk. I'm so inspired. It's amazing how many people tell me I am inspirational when the main line of that talk was, I am not your inspiration. <laughs> people seem to think that people with disabilities are here to make them feel better about themselves. So these people would say to me, I love you so much, my soon. You are so funny, but you need to accept Jesus. And I was like, I do accept Jesus, because guess what? Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet born to a virgin. Mind blowing, I know. Three candidates just passed out cold. <laughs> and I would then say to them, but can you accept that Jesus looks like me, because Jesus was born in Palestine. <laughs> and so that's what I mean by educate. First, I try to educate. But if people refuse to be educated, then I mock them. And that's the comedian in me coming back out to play. So when people insist that America is not a place for Muslims, and you need to go back to your own country, I'm like, you mean New Jersey? Because I know we're different, but it's actually part of the United States. <laughs> and I think they think that there's a country out there called like Islam land, where all the Muslims came from. Because I was doing a show in Texas, and this woman came up to me. And I had told the story about the drunk doctor in New Jersey. And she came up to me, and she goes, so when were you naturalized? And I was like, well, like, you know, my first joke about, like, I'm born in New Jersey. And she's like, I know, I know, but when were you naturalized? And I was like, well, I was born here. And she's like, but you're Muslim. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Sit with it. Just keep sitting with it. So after I'm done rambling, because I'm totally rambling, because it's 12 noon, and that's what I do. Um, there's going to be a Q&A. And you guys have to think of questions and participate. I know, it's hard. But you guys have to ask me questions. Then I'll ignore the questions. And I will talk about whatever I want. <laughs> so after I got engaged, I brought the fiance back to America. And my friends, instead of throwing me a bridal shower, they threw me an intervention. Because here's the problem. I went to Palestine basically single. I come back married, right? And they don't understand that Arab girls don't date. We get married. And if you don't believe me, look at what happened to George Clooney. It's true. It's totally true. And so 
when I walked into my bridal shower, Tina met me at the door holding a piece of paper. And she was like, Maystoon, the decisions you are making are affecting both you and us. And I am here to tell you that you are a free American woman. And you do not, I repeat, you do not have to have an arranged marriage. And I was like, Tina, I arranged it. <laughs> so this whole thing about social media and Twitter and stuff all comes full circle to the fact that I do not think that if I grew up with social media, I would actually ever have become a stand-up comedian. By the time that I got exposed to the fact that people hate online and that that hate can bubble off into the real world, I had a woman named Tammy. Isn't that just the most sinister name? Have you ever met a non-evil Tammy? <laughs> good Tammy, I know you're out there. For every dark side, there's a light, good Tammy. I know you're there. But this woman named Tammy started stalking me on Twitter, and she hated my politics, because I have very controversial politics. I'm here to admit that. I believe in equality for all, regardless of faith, race, ability, orientation, economic class, and anything else that could other you, and people do not dig that kind of radicalism. <laughs> like, the idea that everyone should be equal is just so disgusting, right? And so Tammy was really not having my wanting equality for all. And she somehow found my Chef Uji's cell phone number. And you may ask yourself where Chef Uji is. A Chef Uji is, is a refugee who is a chef because the refugee that I caught and brought to America now owns a vegan food truck, so I call him Chef Uji. And I never use his real name because I don't want people like Tammy to Google him and find me. But somehow she did. And she started calling my house 24 hours a day. And I had to actually go and get like a restraining order. And when you're being cyber stalked, no one takes you seriously at all. And when you're a comedian that travels the world, the restraining order will only cover you in one place. So any other place that I publicly announced that I was going to be made me vulnerable. And it became the reality of my life. The reality of my life is, as a Palestinian who happens to be Muslim because you can be Christian or atheist or Buddhist or Mormon, we're not just one religion, it's not a monolith, but as a Muslim woman that performed uncovered and uncensored all over the Middle East, in Doha, in Beirut, in Jerusalem, Ramallah, Amman, Cairo, I had never in my life been threatened by a fellow Muslim or a fellow Arab who identified as such. And in America, the reality of my life is, on a daily basis, I get threats from right-wing extremists who do not believe that I have the right to exist in this country. And it's interesting to me that we live in an age where I grew up with the same best friends. They never made fun of me. The disabled kids that reach out to me on a daily basis online now, because one of the blessings of the TED Talk was the fact that people who never had access to the world now do. That means people who are nonverbal, people who don't have the ability to go to settings like this, because up until recently, buildings weren't accessible. They got a whole new accessibility to the the world through the internet. So for every troll, there was another person who was worth knowing. For example, I'm rarely defeated, and I have this mantra, and it's, I, you know, yes, you can, can, right? My dad taught me it. It's yes, you can, can means like you can do anything. And sometimes I get defeated, and one of the times was when I was offered a job writing at the Daily Beast. And I really wanted to do it, but I couldn't physically keep up with the typing. And if I paid a typist, I would actually make no money. So I complained about it on Twitter, and this woman named Mary volunteered to type for me. And she's been typing for me for three years straight. She typed a book, she typed a screenplay, every single article I've ever written for the Daily Beast and BBC and anything else I've ever written for, and she's never charged me a dime. And there's another thing that I do, which is I live tweet the amazing race. And I've been doing this for years, and I have a teammate, and our team is called Team Wheelbarrow Zonkey. It's a long story. But we race every single season. And by the end of it, I feel like I actually have raced around the world 
in a race that I could never actually do. And the amazing race and reality TV is the one place that we actually see disability reflected honestly in media. With Dancing with Stars, The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette is my favorite example of mainstreaming disability because there was a bachelorette who was missing a limb and she proved that you could be disabled, vapid, annoying, and desperate, <laughs> just like any other bachelorette. <laughs> That's the other problem. The other problem is on the rare occasion that television does cast someone with a disability, we are rarely seeing people of color. And when they do, as I said, you don't see them as the lawyer on Scandal or the best friend on The Big Bang Theory or a romantic lead in a sitcom. It's always that very special episode. <laughs> and one of two things has to happen. Either they have to be healed or they have to scream, you can't love me because I'm disabled. And I just want to scream back, no, we can't love you because you're annoying. <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> I have a lot of anger because in the oppression Olympics, I would win a gold medal. I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm disabled, I'm a female, and I live in New Jersey. <laughs> it just doesn't get worse than that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up everything that I've been talking about uh, with a joke that has nothing to do with anything because I feed off laughter and then a really serious statement about how you guys can uh, fix this broken world because the world is busted. Um, I decided to stop using the word bitch because bitch is misogynistic. And it never really occurred to me, except I was doing this panel with Felicity Huffman. Sorry, I just dropped the name on palsy. I dropped stuff, hips. And she was like, you know, we shouldn't use the word bitch because it's misogynistic. But I'm so used to using it that I needed to find a replacement word. So like, I'd love you guys to join me in replacing bitch with the following word, popple. It's spelled P-O-P-P-L-E. And for those of you who don't know what a popple is, it was a stuffed animal from the 80s that had the ability to stuff its head in its butt and become a ball. <laughs> and it works out perfectly as, as a replacement for the word bitch because first of all, like if I'm like, why are you being such a popple? The person you're yelling at is like, I don't even know what she just said. <laughs> am, I, am I insulted? I kind of, I don't know. And then like, what a basic popple. <laughs> or you're like, popple, please. And what you're saying is stick your head in your ass and roll out of here. <laughs> So it's like my Fetcher Fleek, and I would really appreciate if the Google empire started using Popple instead of bitch. Okay, can I get a witness? Um, so the world is broken, but we can fix it. We can fix it by saying no. Say no to being an internet troll, and if you have kids, say no to raising an internet troll. Say no to arming violence worldwide, and say no to violence against women. It is very, very disturbing that I can walk around a war zone at 2 o'clock in the morning and feel safer than I do at 2 o'clock in the morning on a U.S. college campus. Say no to being silenced. Your voice is your weapon against inequality. Use it. My name is Maysoon Zayed, and if I can can, you can can. Thank you, Google. People are always fascinated by the fact that I can walk in heels, or limp in heels, as I like to call it. And there's a good reason for that, and that's because when my dad taught me how to walk, he used to dangle a dollar bill in front of me and have me chase it. And so like my inner stripper is so strong that I was like running in stilettos at like five. OK, who has a question? In the back. What happened with the person that made a slur against you in the car? I'm sorry? 
Um, you're, you give an example where someone made a slur. Okay, so the, the person who made the slur against me in the car was actually my best friend. And she is proof that a lot of people still to this day do not know that the R word is a slur. And now I'm going to talk to you about words. I think that context actually matters. And I had the mothers against the R word came after me because I tell that joke. And the reason I tell that joke is if you go online and go look at clips of me, you'll find 10 to 20 people in the comment section that say she's retarded or retard. Like, I get called it all the time. So I think of it as a word that I can use because I want people to understand that not only is that offensive, but it's sometimes a word that people don't even realize they're being offensive. So when she said it, she didn't know that it was a bad thing. Uh, you know, I work with kids in refugee camps, and often the kids with cerebral palsy are put with the kids with the intellectual disabilities because we slur and we drag words, and some of us, some of us are nonverbal. And the assumption is, if you're nonverbal, that you don't understand. And it's a really big issue in America. There's 30 states that don't allow people with certain disabilities to get married. And there's been a lot of opposition to this because with the creation of technology that allows the nonverbal community to now express themselves, we're able to show people that these people do have opinions and that they do have feelings. And just because they can't verbalize it doesn't mean they don't think of those things. So. I don't punish Tina, but what I do now is I punish people on Facebook. So one of the things that people like to do is they'll write, this fucking retarded about something that's really stupid and should be criticized. And I come back, I'm like, guys, you can't use the R word on my page. And then they'll come right back and put fucktard or libtard. And I'm like, OK, guys, the word tard cannot be used on this page. But the Crip community, we call ourselves the Crip community. We use the word cripple. We don't like the fact that it's used on news reports to describe things that are negative. We're trying to bring back like a positive image to it. Because you have a lot of associations, and I'm going off on a tangent, but I hope it makes sense. You have a lot of associations that are run by parents or people without the disabilities speaking for the people with disabilities. This happens with CP, it happens with autism, and it happens with a lot of other disabilities. And there's a myth that people with disabilities spend day and night dreaming of being healed. And it's just not the truth. And so there's a lot of people trying to cure us. There's a lot of suggestions of unnecessary, brutal surgeries that parents that have no idea, they just want to fix their broken kid. They don't understand that you can have quality of life, that having a disability becomes part of your personality like any other aspect of your personality. And I've seen parents have these extensive surgeries without the child ever giving permission. And the kids grow up and they resent it because they feel like they were never good enough and the parents were always trying to fix them. And I think what made me so confident was my parents weren't trying to fix me. They just didn't really care that I had a disability. So it was never a big deal in our family. I was treated exactly the same way that my sisters were. If they had to clean, I had to clean. If they went to bed, I went to bed. I got you know, no leeway because of the disability. And they did things to help improve my health, but I never even realized they were doing it. Like they sent me a dancing school so that I could walk. They sent me a piano instead of occupational therapy because I was born in a time where the ADA didn't exist, accessibility didn't exist. And they just tried their hardest to mainstream me. And I lucked out and I don't understand why. Why am I the person who ended up with the friends whose parents parents taught them to be decent. Why is it that to this day, like, there's a campaign going on right now, and it's such a nightmare. It's called Just Say Hi. And it's by one of these foundations that don't know what they're doing. And they suggested that if you see a disabled person, just say hi. <laughs> Excuse me. I I'm not a zoo animal. And, and so we reacted. And I was like, first of all, I'm really busy. And if you like come up to me while I'm eating and you just say hi, I'm just going to spit and blame the CP. And, 
And then they delved further and they said, well, you know, it's because people don't know how to approach people with disabilities. And this is fascinating to me that in 2015, people don't know how to talk to someone with CP. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because if you turn on your TV, there are no positive images of disability. And that is where children learn a lot more than from their parents. Yes, parents have dropped the ball at teaching their kids to be more accepting, whether it's of someone who doesn't believe in Santa or someone who has severe burns. That is a parent's job. But you and I, we all know a lot of parents are not good parents. Like, that's a total myth. And I hate on holidays when social media is flooded with stuff like, if you don't call your mom, you're an asshole. Well, maybe they don't have a mother. Maybe their mother beat them their entire lives. Like, you know, so what do we look at then? We look at TV. Why doesn't Sesame Street have a permanent disabled character? Why doesn't Dora have a disabled friend? Why, when you turn on daytime talk shows, a show like The View that has represented every type of woman you could imagine, including those with their solo information, they should never speak in public. <laughs> They've never once had a visibly disabled host. Why? So if you don't see these people on television and you don't meet these people in real life, that's what makes us a spectacle. But it's shocking to me that a foundation that claims to represent people with CP decided to do a campaign with a bunch of celebrity videos, none of which included celebrities with CP, saying, if you see me on the street, just say hi. <laughs> Again, like, I'm totally paranoid about, about being killed. It's like my big thing, right? I have no fear. I've been in war zones. I've been shot at, but not hit. That's what counts. But <laughs> I'm a touring comic. I tour by myself. So I'm constantly afraid of being serial killed. So if random people just start popping up and saying hi, I'm going to, like, start doing jujitsu, and it's not going to be pretty. Next question. <laughs> Are there any things that you find encouraging about what's happened since your talk and all of the success with it? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned that TV hasn't progressed, yeah. but are there the rays of hope in terms of seeing people with visible disabilities as just normal people? Yeah. So the, the downside of the TED Talk was I got millions and millions of hits. I had the number one TED Talk of 2014. I beat all the men. <laughs> it's not a competition. I just won. And, uh, and I was shocked because after Countdown with Keith Oberman, no one would hire me. And I heard two things. One, she's too distracting, and they're talking about me shaking. And two, we hate her politics, and they're talking about me wanting equality for Palestinians. That's what they hate about my politics, to be clear. And, uh, but the upside of it was the people that I told you about, the people that reached out to me like Dominic Evans. Dominic Evans, every Saturday night, does a chat, night chat, but like a thing where he does hashtag film dis, like the word film and the beginning of the word disability. And he reached out to me and he was like, hey, me soon, you know, we've been fighting against able-bodied actors playing disabled for years now. And we do this hashtag and I joined the group. And when I joined the group, a lot of my friends who were non-disabled, like Jonas Elrod and Lexi Alexander, they started following these guys and realizing there are disabled directors, there are disabled writers, there are disabled actors. And a lot of the blowback I got after the TED Talk was she would have no career if she didn't have CP. And I thought that's so hilarious, like because as if Hollywood just loves disability so much. <laughs> and it was amazing to me that it didn't translate into the work I wanted. But it was also amazing to me that people literally have written to me saying, I was going to kill myself. I am now not going to. And that's the thing that I never expected. I joke about I never want to be a role model because anyone who follows me will end up running around Times Square naked screaming jihad. But I have people reaching out to me that just had a kid with cerebral palsy who 
you know, were sitting there mourning the child that they lost, not realizing that the child that they had could have a great life and, and that it wasn't the end, it was actually just the beginning. I've had people with cerebral palsy that are fighting with their colleges and feeling totally defeated reach out to me. And then I get on the phone with the college, I'm like, you don't want me to tweet this. You do not want me to tweet this. Get rid of that gravel path. And you know, I do yoga. So there was this theory and it's like, if you Google it, I say that all the time. You can go on my Twitter and see how many times I go, oh, just Google it. I'm not doing your homework. But if you Google this, people claim that people with CP start to deteriorate after the age of 25. In my case, when I was 27, the resting position of my hands was this. And then I started doing yoga, and I actually progressed. So I have people with CP reach out to me who have just, you know, thought that this was the end of the road for them. I'm like, no, you got to look into nutrition and you got to look into exercise. And I've been able to give advice to people in Malaysia, in Texas, in places that like I would never meet them otherwise. And what works for me won't work for everyone. But if I'm able to like get that one person that just never had a friend to feel like they have a friend, like that's, you know, I said, the internet's like Star Wars, right? And there's a dark side. But the light side is a lot of people who never had friends can actually now find and have friends. They can find that community online that believes in what they believe in. And I think that that's something that no matter what else I do in my life, like win an Oscar, which I will do, I just need to get cast in a movie because disabilities win awards. <laughs> I think that that's one of the biggest things that's affected me is the fact that I know that there are people who had absolutely no hope who do now, who are living healthier, more productive lives. And it's great to have this team of disabled actors that are on my side with wanting the representation to change in Hollywood. Because in the intersection of intersectionality, disability got run over. We're the last community to be represented. So like everyone else is making leaps and bounds, and we're still not. And when you realize that you're not the only one fighting it, together with our voices, we were able to get the Screen Actors Guild Union to partner and do a workshop that was all about what's wrong with disability and entertainment this summer. And we had people from CBS and you know from all the big networks coming in to see and understanding that like, it's 2015. We don't need a just say hi campaign. We need to be mainstreamed. Next question. Two at a time. He's first, you're second. <laughs> I watched him touch the base. I, I actually have okay. um, a meeting at one, but it was very one, interesting watching you. Two, Thank you. Three. I had a meeting at one, but it was very interesting watching you. Thank okay, you thank much. you so much. Follow me on maysoon.com, M-A-Y-S-O-O-N.com. If you forget, palsy Palestinian. Palsy Palestinian. <laughs> okay, I think she's in the light. So how do you think technology can help? I'm sorry? How do you think technology can technology help? can help on every different level? One of the biggest things that the one of the biggest obstacles that the disability community alone is facing is the fact that we often are denied the right to education worldwide. And I work with disabled and wounded refugee children with physical disabilities that were left out by the public school system. And one of our biggest assets is using technology so that they can communicate. It really is a game changer for people that are nonverbal, for people who are missing limbs. It's so important. I did something for Google a couple of years ago called uh, Conflict and Connected World. World, and I think that technology also helps as a voice of the oppressed. Uh, I've seen such a difference in the way um, political events have been covered in the past 10 years than I did in the 90s when it was completely controlled by governments letting cameras in or not. And now you have all these citizen journalists who are giving a voice that we would never otherwise hear. And I think that has really been a game changer for people who suffer oppression. Where I've seen it completely fail is in battling violence against women because social media has become another form of violence against us. So I'm not quite sure how technology plays into battling that. Um, I don't think documenting helps. We saw that when, when kids, kids got a one-year sentence for brutal rape. So I don't know how technology can be used to kind of solve that. So if you figure it out, you let me know. Yes? 
Uh, two questions. One's very quick. The vegan food truck you mentioned that the yeah. refugees started, what is that? It's called Falafel. It's based in Hoboken in Jersey City. <laughs> and it's really interesting because one of the things that I found out was that sugar, chemicals, caffeine, and meat, meat products, uh, made my cerebral palsy more severe. They made me spaz more. So like when Kanye is like holding me back and about to spaz, if I ate a cheeseburger, I was like, I'm spazzing. So I decided to try vegan and it cut down my spasticity by I would say about 60% and it completely changed my digestion, the way I breathe and it just really helped. Problem is, I'm addicted to cheese. So I'm constantly falling off the vegan wagon. I just had some cheddar sun chips and I was like, I need sour cream. And like, I just, I'm, I'm a failed wannabe vegan. And so my husband started a vegan food truck because I don't allow any meat in the house. And he, he's basically a vegan chef. It's, it's really cool. And I think he's really interesting. I never, ever, ever talk about him because I never wanted people to think that marriage was an accomplishment because it's not and I do not recommend it <laughs> but he's a fascinating story because this is a dude who all five of his brothers have been shot all five have survived and he and all five of his brothers have been political prisoners at some point in his life and when he lived in Bethlehem he had absolutely no chance of pursuing any sort of dream so when he came to America I was like you're free you can do anything, what's your dream? And he said, I wanna work in a supermarket. And I said, no, that is not your dream. <laughs> and then he came up with the vegan food truck and now he's a business owner and you know, he bought me this ring to replace the one I bought. And uh, you know, it, the American dream is something that no one believes exists anymore unless you live in a nightmare. And then when you do, you know it does, so. What was the second question? The second question was, what's the most annoying thing about using your phone? About, I barely use my phone. The most annoying thing about using my phone is that it falls out of my hand constantly. So I just have a series of shattered Blackberries. <laughs> and I have to use a Blackberry because I need a keypad, because otherwise I'd just be slapping a smartphone feeling stupid. And um, I hate the phone. I never answer my phone calls. My voicemail says I never answer my phone calls. And I don't answer. And I don't check my voice messages. So if you actually want to talk to me, text me. Um, and people will go find me on Twitter. Like, I'll ignore my phone, and suddenly my agent will be tweeting me, like, answer your damn phone. And, you know, my mom's not on social media, and that's good. Um, I would hate that, yeah. So, okay, we have time for one last question. It has to be outlandish. No pressure. But one of my nails broke. I need to get off stage and, because it's snagging my face. The guy in the New York Yankees cap in denial that the Mets are finally winning! <laughs> I'm a lifelong Mets fan, not a fair weather friend, and again, you can go on my social media and see 10 years of me crying. <laughs> I'm actually more of a fan of Yankees hats than nice. Yankees. Nice. Yeah. That is so strange. Yeah. What other hats do you fan? Uh, and anything. I'm a bald guy. I get a something on my hand, so I gotta have a hat. I feel your baldness. Yeah. Um, just gonna pat myself for a while. <laughs> Trying to bring sexy back to disability. Is it working? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you've traveled a lot, and yeah. I'm wondering if there was any place <laughs> that you've been that, that's really doing things right uh, by you. Cambridge uh, High School in Massachusetts. That's the only place that's really doing it right. Um, as far as accessibility or as far as equality? Um, I, I can go with either. Yeah, um, like I went to Luxembourg and I thought that place would be perfect and it wasn't. So like Europe is failing on equality. The Middle East is a hot mess. Um, Texas is a nightmare, but the food is really good. There's no place There's no place that's getting it right, but there are places that are doing a lot better than we are. So I just flew back from Canada, and they are definitely, definitely more diverse. Like when I turned on the TV and started watching TV in Canada, they're so much more diverse than we are. BBC actually forced their... Um, 
people who are producers to like commit to putting on more disabled people and more people of color. And a lot of people think that's forced and it's not. Like having something that reflects reality is not forced, it's accurate. Um, but this, this Cambridge school, they were the most accessible school I've ever seen. They did it totally right. They had captioning. So like a lot of people use auto captioning. Auto captioning is horrible. It's terrible. It's like the game of telephone. It has nothing to do with what's being said. So like Cambridge School live captions everything. It's extremely diverse. The entire campus was accessible. So in that little microchasm was the best I've ever seen it done. But I'll take your question in a totally different direction and talk about my favorite places to do comedy. So, of course, I you can sit and relax. You don't have to stay. I love, of course, I love doing comedy in New York, right? Because this is the center of the universe. And I got to perform with Dave Chappelle and Louis Black. And you could only do that in New York City because I would be a loser waiting my turn at a club. And they would walk in and do comedy. And then I'd be like, I did a show with Dave Chappelle. Um, <laughs> But I love doing comedy in Texas. And they are the most like jubilant, happy, ready to laugh crowd I have ever seen. And even though they're in denial, Texas is really diverse. Like I saw like 50 shades of brown. I was like, wow. You know, and uh worldwide I love doing shows in Beirut. It's another party city, but I get to do comedy in Arabic and I love doing comedy in Arabic because Arabic is such a great language. It has like all these different words and people are used to um Arabic being shouted on TV. So the ability to go out there and do tons of jokes in Arabic and have it be like light and, and full of laughter, that's really, really cool for me. And uh, the best show that I ever did in my life was I got to perform for Muhammad Ali. And I got on stage and I said, I'm performing for the man who floats like a butterfly, stings like a pea, has Parkinson's and shakes just like me, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and uh, so that was my favorite, favorite performance. But as I wrap up and let you go back to your work, I'll tell you about my favorite celebrity meeting. So I love Dave Matthews. <laughs> I had seen him 103 times in concert. And <laughs> I, from the age of 14, I used to say to my friends, someday I'm going to meet Dave Matthews. We're going to chat, become friends. He's going to give me his number. I'm going to tell him all about Palestine. And so I got cast in this movie with Adam Sandler called You Don't Mess with the Zohan. And I walk on set, and it's like a comedy dream come true. I walk on set, and it's Chris Rock, Dana Carvey, Kevin Nealon, Kevin James, Rob Schneider, Adam Sandler, and Henry Winkler, the Fonz. And I'm like, oh, my God. I've obviously died and gone to comedy heaven. Um, <laughs> And I was trying so hard to be cool and failing. And I had this laptop bag that said Dave Matthews. And Adam Sandler says to me, oh, you like Dave Matthews? He's in the movie. And I was like, ah, oh, funny man. <laughs> so I go and I get my makeup done to go on set. And this is like a $100 million movie. So if you're late, you make anything late, you're losing like thousands of dollars. And I walk out on set in full makeup, and I see Dave Matthews. <laughs> And so Adam Sandler comes to introduce me, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe this is actually happening. And so I was so happy because I had this beautiful makeup and this amazing outfit from wardrobe, and I looked great like to meet Dave Matthews. And I turned around, and I went, <laughs> and I started ugly crying. And like the snot was meeting the drool, and it was all going down. And the makeup people came running up to me because I'm supposed to go on set, and I'm crying off my face. And I started like ranting, and I I was like, and when I went to the prom and nobody would dance, I was just like crash into me. And then I was listening to Red Rocks and there was a war and I was like crash and I was crying. And then the makeup woman came up to me and Dave put his arm around me and I crumpled. <laughs> And then I came to, and they like put me in timeout. And I was driving home that night, and I was like, oh, I carried a watermelon. And then I came back the next day, and I didn't know he was going to be on set. And as I was walking across set, there's like 100 witnesses, because nobody would believe this story otherwise. He sang my name. We became friends. He gave me his number, and we talked about Palestine. So dreams can, can come true. Thank you again, Google. I'm Mason Zarek.